Hi everyone and welcome to Optolom Astronomy Filter Channel. As you know, I live in the northern part of France, where the sky suffers from significant light pollution. When we want to do astrophotography with a telescope, we need to use a light pollution filter. However, when the light pollution is very intense, it becomes problematic. I have some great news for you. For those who use Micro Four Three or smaller cameras, such as the ZWO ASI 1600 or the ZWO ASI 294, there's a new filter that has just been released, and I invite you to test it together. It's the Optolong L Ultimate 1.25 filter. The advantage is that it is much cheaper than the 2 inch L Ultimate filter. But there's something you need to know this type of filter is extremely restrictive and allows very little light to pass through. So, there are a few tips and tricks you should be aware of. Today, I'll share some tips and conduct the test of the Optolong L Ultimate 1.25 filter. Stay tuned on Optolong Astronomy Filter Channel. So technically, I'm not telling you anything new. This filter comes in a small cardboard box. Inside, you'll find a nice little plastic box with the filter in it. Most of you will be using a 2-inch filter holder, which is actually one of the reasons why you might encounter some difficulties in using this filter. But I have two good news for you. First, there are adapters available to fit this filter onto your filter holder. Second, I will provide links in the description where you can download an STL file for your 3D printer to directly adapt the filter into a filter holder. You can either adapt it to a push-in filter holder or directly print a 1.25 filter holder. As you know me well, I have made the STL files available on Thingiverse, and you will find three files there. The first two are the filter adapter compatible with the ZWO M42M48 filter holder. So, that's the 1.25 filter adapter, consisting of two parts that simply need to be glued together. No support is needed during printing. The second file is an adapter from 1.25 to M48 for filters. In this case, you will need to use supports during printing because you will have a slightly cantilevered part. Make sure to use a print with a minimal layer thickness, preferably 0.12 millimeters. Take your time during printing, go for a slow print, and you'll see that it will turn out quite well. And then we take this filter holder. Now, it's a little delicate. The filter is placed, and it can be inserted into the instrument. I can confirm that this filter is fully compatible with the 294MC or 1600 mono cameras. There are absolutely no vignetting issues with this filter. There are two or three important things to know about this filter in order to get the most out of it. You should be aware that this filter is much more restrictive than any other filter on the market, as its bandwidth is narrow, only 3 nanometers in hydrogen H-alpha and oxygen 3. Therefore, you will have very little light reaching your sensor. Even though the absolute amount of light corresponding to hydrogen and oxygen will be the same as with a wider filter on a nebula, the rest of the sky background light will be much fainter. As a result, you may struggle to achieve a homogeneous and clean sky background. So, the first tip to know is that I highly recommend using light pollution shields to protect against stray light. This will significantly improve the overall image quality and help prevent unwanted light artifacts. The second thing is that you will need to capture well-made flats. Pay close attention to the signal-to-noise ratio in your flat frames. Follow the recommended guidelines to properly increase the ADU levels and capture appropriate flats. Also, make sure to correctly calibrate your files at the appropriate temperature. You may be surprised to see red modeling on the flat frames when viewed on the screen. However, this is perfectly normal. The phenomenon occurs with the LE Extreme, L Enhance, and even the L Ultimate filters. The more restrictive the filter is, the more this phenomenon appears on my 294MC camera.
It's important to note that this is not specific to Optolon, as other competing brands have the same issue. There is a discussion on WebAstro about this problem, and I'll provide the link in the description. Of course, photographing a star cluster with an ultra-restrictive filter is not the best test to perform. However, it's worth mentioning that this phenomenon can be effectively mitigated with well-captured flat frames, preferably with zero gain, a histogram at the midpoint, and clean data. Performing sky background gradient subtraction can also be helpful at times. It's crucial to have long exposure times and an extended imaging session. I would recommend exposure times of at least five minutes and a total session time of two hours. There is a discussion on cloudy nights where an amateur astronomer experienced the same issue. They opened their camera and took photos through an H-alpha filter, and they found the same modeling as seen in their flat frames. At that point, they contacted ZWO, who confirmed that a certain number of 294MC Pro cameras, as well as the 1600MC Pro, had this problem. As for the 183MC Pro and 171MC Pro cameras, apparently, they don't have this problem, nor do the 533, 2600, and 6200 cameras. This is important information to keep in mind. However, I have the 1600 monochrome camera, and I don't have this issue, so it seems to be related to certain color cameras from ZWO. According to the information I have, the 294 from Altair might not have this problem, but it's still an unconfirmed piece of information. So, despite this issue, it is still possible to obtain good results, but you need to accumulate more signal by taking longer exposure times. Lastly, and this is crucial, take much longer exposures than you were used to. If you were previously able to take 30-second or 1-minute exposures, clearly even 2 minutes will be insufficient. It is recommended to work with exposure times of at least 5 minutes, and ideally 10 minutes or more. This will provide a significant improvement because otherwise, you will be very close to the read noise of your sensor, making it much more challenging to achieve a smooth and homogeneous sky background. It is essential to use auto-guiding and dithering between each exposure to ensure accurate telescope tracking and achieve the best overall signal during your imaging session. Once you have taken these three elements into consideration, you should be able to maximize the potential of your L-Ultimate filter. Now, it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for, the test results. I took out my 61 EDPH telescope on my balcony and captured several targets using the L-Ultimate filter. My first sessions were challenging, but they provided an opportunity to learn what to do and what not to do. Let's start with IC443, the Jellyfish Nebula, using the 294MC Pro camera. I took 29 exposures of 3 minutes totaling 87 minutes. However, I observed that the sky background lacked uniformity, with a mottling effect present. I then switched to the ASI 1600 monochrome pro camera and captured 37 exposures of 3 minutes, totaling 1 hour and 51 minutes. The sky background was noticeably cleaner, which proved that the issue did not come from the filter but from the camera. Next, I photographed NGC 2244, the Rosette Nebula, with only 11 exposures of 3 minutes each. This was clearly not sufficient, the sky background exhibited significant mottling once again. It becomes evident that longer exposure times and extended imaging sessions are necessary to overcome this issue. After a few weeks of research to understand the cause of the observed phenomenon, I got back to work. First, on M16, the Eagle Nebula, which was quite low at 50 degrees north latitude, using 12 exposures of 5 minutes, and then 21 exposures of 5 minutes. In these images, the magnificent H2 regions are clearly visible. This demonstrates the effectiveness of the filter in highly light polluted skies. Next, I moved on to M17, the Omega Nebula, with 12 exposures of 5 minutes, and then with 24 exposures of 5 minutes each, totaling exactly 2 hours of exposure time. 
In these images, you can clearly see that the sky background is significantly cleaner, without any sort of modeling. The nebulae are surrounded by beautiful H2 regions. I then attempted M8 and M20, which were even lower on the horizon, using only 17 exposures of 5 minutes each. In these images, you may notice that the blue H-beta region of M20 is missing, which is expected since the filter only allows oxygen-3 and H-alpha wavelengths to pass through. While the signal in this region may still be somewhat lacking, it is remarkable to see such images under light-polluted skies like Leo. So, what can we conclude about this filter after a few observing sessions, albeit slightly disrupted by weather conditions? It is indeed an excellent filter. However, it is crucial to have a high-quality holder to ensure it is properly orthogonal to the optical axis of your instrument. Otherwise, you may encounter some unwanted reflections. When you begin to stretch your sky background, pay attention to this aspect. Ideally, Purchasing a commercially machined metal holder would be better than relying on a 3D printed one, although it is possible to achieve good results with the latter. This filter is clearly very interesting. For example, when using an ASCR for light stacking, you will quickly notice that you have a good amount of signal, but more importantly, excellent contrast, allowing you to capture the details in your nebulae effectively. Finally, you can apply an HOO type of processing to your images, as the green and blue photosites on your sensor capture the oxygen wavelength. By combining these two channels and reassigning them to the green and blue channels, you can increase their signal-to-noise ratio and achieve better results in post-processing. So this filter, I used it with both a monochrome and a color camera, and it's very interesting to work in this way because the monochrome camera, being more sensitive due to the combination of oxygen and hydrogen on each of the pixel sites, allows us to have a much cleaner luminance layer which helps improve the final signal-to-noise ratio of the image. That's all there is to say about this filter. It is logically less expensive than the 2-inch filter, making it suitable for use with micro four-thirds cameras as well. I was able to verify that there is no vignetting with this filter, based on a focal diameter ratio of 4.5 or more with these cameras. So, it's great news for those who didn't want to invest in a 2-inch filter without having the corresponding camera. Thank you very much to Optolong for lending me this filter for testing. I highly recommend this filter, and I invite you to stay tuned for more tests on Optolong Astronomy Filter Channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, feel free to subscribe and check out the various playlists, which provide valuable learning resources for astronomy and photography. All right, I'll see you soon on Optolong Astronomy Filter Channel. Thank you. Goodbye.